everyone. Um, I guess we're just going to get started. So thanks for coming in um, and being on time, even though we're not. But uh, my name is Sam, and I'm, a, I'm the digital storyteller at the Emerging Media Lab. So thank you for coming to the first MCOP of the school year. Um, the Emerging Media Lab here at UBC usually hosts these, but um, we'd like to invite other schools to host them. If you're interested, please come to us um, every month. So they happen every month. So to start off, I'd just like to acknowledge that this is the traditional, traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam um, and some housekeeping things. So in case anything were to happen, which of course it probably will not, there are two doors over here and you can exit on both ends of UBC Studios. Um, so we'd also like to apologize that the first MCOP event is happening this month instead of um, last month in September when it was supposed to happen um, due to the climate strike. So that was unavoidable. Um, and oh, <laughs> so yeah, so people were able to attend in that case. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I'd just like to say that this for our theme for today is photogrammetry and 3D modeling. Um, and I'd like to welcome our three speak or three different presenters. Um, and first up is David Clement. He um, will be presenting um, a presentation on using phones to augment immersive um, experiences. A little bit about David. So David Clement is a serial innovator with over 35 years of experience. He has held technical leadership roles in organizations including the BBC, CNN, US Department of Homeland Security, Discrete Logic, WaveSign, wow, and many more. Okay. And David is fluent in many disciplines, including philosophy, business, and startup culture, machine intelligence, virtual reality, computer graphics, as well as system and software architecture. David is currently working at a startup focused on improving the physical and social development of youth. We might have to invite you back for other themes then. <laughs> so yeah, please give a warm welcome to David. Thank you. Uh, so this is a bit, a bit of an unusual uh, presentation because basically it's just a demonstration. Okay, so I'm just demonstrating to you the technologies that are available in the world right now Everything I'm showing you will be running on my phone in real time. Everything I'm showing you is free and open source. Okay, so there's nothing proprietary about what I'm showing you. It's all out there. Okay. So what I'd like to do is take you through a progression. Uh, there is. Oh, uh, let's try and get this up. So I'm running the latest iPhone. It's very cool. Um, you'll see why in a little while. But uh, okay. Are uh, you seeing that? Not yet. Ah, no, there we no. go. Excellent. All right. So, first of all, um, about two years ago, the state of the art, uh, or for a while now, the state of the art has been in what is known as um, uh, categorization. Uh, and really, what this is about is the ability to expose real world objects to the phone, and it has the ability to work out what it's looking at, mm -hmm. okay? So as I move around, you'll see that uh, it's able to detect with some degree of accuracy what these various different objects are, okay? So that's a classifier, all right? And th this has been around for quite a while. And what it's doing is, is it's essentially looking at every pixel in the image, and based on what it thinks that pixel is, it's giving you a confidence score of the biggest thing in the picture is this. Okay, so that's a classifier. Classifiers, uh, when combined with another technology, can become what are known as detectors. So what detectors do is they have the ability to detect objects in the world and classify them. All right, so this isn't, uh, sorry, yeah, good point. Yeah, so uh, yeah, unfortunately the labels are rotated, but you get the sense. So as I move around the scene, it's able to detect objects in the scene and give them labels. All right. So now we have a spatial sense and semantics. We have labels for things. We can say that's a this and that's a that. So that's semantic labeling. And we have the sense of uh, where they are in the world. Okay, very good. So let's look at where things are in the world. Okay, so here you can see, I'm just going to uh, fire up 
my AR app here. So this is a free and open source, I don't think it's open source, but it's a free app from Apple called Reality Composer. And what you can do with this is you can basically uh, drag real world objects, uh, sorry, drag uh, virtual objects into a scene and manipulate them. So here you can see I have a couple of objects. I have a, a cup and I have, hang on, I have a cup and I have a cube. And look at the quality of rendering of that cup in the scene. It's rock solid, okay? And it really is as if it's really there. This is quite extraordinary uh, technology. Now, my point is this. This is machine learning at work. Right? This is not algorithms. This is models and data. And what's happening here is that the machine is able to use its GPS location and the fact that there is this surface here to create something equivalent to a, a web page. Okay, So it's saying at this location there is what is known as an anchor. That's the name, the technical name. And this table is this anchor. So I can put... Uh, things at this anchor and then I can come back to them at a later time and they'll still be here or I can map them onto an anchor that's near me. So if I find a table that's roughly the same size near me, I can uh, essentially load that web page, if you will, that model and stick it to the world. That's actually not my point. My point is, is that the phone has a visceral sense of its environment. Right. It knows where it is in the world. It knows how it's oriented in the world. It can pick up visual features in the world. So it has a real sense of presence. Okay. So that's really my point here. Uh, I can go on about Reality Composer another time, but it's a very powerful technology. Okay. So now let's talk about tracking. So tracking is the ability for the system to... Um, I'll do this... Okay, so I'm going to track my daughter climbing over some rocks here. So I just drag a box over her, and I hit play. So this is a very complex scene. She has a dress that's blowing in the wind. Okay, she's climbing around on rocks, and it's struggling a bit. It's a very difficult thing to do. But it's able to track her by comparing the features from the previous frame with the features in this frame. Okay. So we now have the ability not only to place objects in the real world to give them semantic labels, but we can track them as they move. Okay. So this is known as Siamese tracking, and if you're interested, I can give you some links on it, but it's a very powerful technology. Okay, so now we can track objects. Clearly, it can't track uh, objects that aren't in the view, but uh, you get my point. All right, so let's move on to the next level. So... We've been talking about tracking, and we've been talking about semantic labeling. But I just want to give you a sense of the state of the art in face tracking. This is quite extraordinary. So I'm going to go to anchors. Now, it's tracking about 80 points on my face in real time. Okay? If I put my face up very close, you can see, it can actually even see my eyes, my pupils. And if I look up, I look left, I look right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and it's, it's very, very resilient. I can move my head in lots of really interesting ways. Okay. <laughs> so now, the system that has semantic labels for things in the world that knows where it is, that has a visceral sense of its environment, can see me and can see what I'm looking at. Okay, the plot thickens. All right, so let's go to the next level, which is me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to this guy. So I have to flip the phone over, so I hope this works, because I can't see myself. Um, all right. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 perfectly. Oh, it's not showing? Uh, no, went to sleep. It's showing you, but the, the, not on. No, no, the oh, is not on yet. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to probably point the phone down or move it a bit further away. Sorry, I'm just trying to... That's okay. I can't see what I'm doing here, so... Um, you want me to... Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Okay, okay sorry. Yeah. Okay. Is it 
clear now? Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So basically, you have real-time, high-quality, 3D, full-body motion tracking <laughs> in real-time on your phone. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. okay. It just Once again. <laughs> Uh, so, we now have a sense of me, where I am, it can, now that it knows where I am... David, your phone went dead. Oh, yeah, sorry, no, just have to tap the screen. Sorry. Just wait. Yes. Uh, you need to... Uh, oh, I need to look that. at it. Sorry, yeah. place that yeah. Anyway, what? that's kind of my point here. Yeah. All right, okay. sorry. Done. Sorry. Um, okay, so the post tracking is really good. I will set it up at the end, and I invite you to come and try any and all of these demos. Yeah. Please do. It's well worth your time. Okay, now we have to make a giant leap. Okay, so not what we're going to talk about now is something called, uh, let me, what's the correct word, saliency. Has anyone here heard of saliency before? Very good. All right, so saliency is the ability, so there's several different ways of training saliency. Okay, one way is to do eye tracking on people as they move through their lives, okay, and record what they are looking at, okay, what they're paying attention to. And if you can get them to, pay, if you can record what they're paying attention to, you can create a model that actually tells you what people are looking at when in anywhere in the world. So this is what's called a saliency map, all right? So what's going on here, and I, I, I'm not recording this, please, there are no privacy concerns, I swear to God, okay? <laughs> it is seeing what we see in the most visceral sense. It is trained on what people look at in the world and it is able to identify anywhere, anything, things that are of interest to us. Mm. <laughs> In real time, on your phone, blah, 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 the other stuff. Yeah, so this is remarkable. Now, what's also remarkable is the fact that it can actually load different models. So what, does compu what do computers see when they look out into the world? They see this. Okay. This has huge implications for immersive technology. The, com the, co the combination of these capabilities is extraordinary. Uh, I hope you get a visceral sense of that. So, really what I'm trying to get at is that we are shifting now, right? Ten years ago, it was about geometry, it was about scripting, it was about trying to create narratives that are linear, that you can pull people through. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving to this kind of noisy, localized jumble of information that the computer can actually make sense of and give us inferences about our world. So here's a couple of scenarios that might be of interest. So. What is of interest when you are on holiday? Like, what do other people look at? What, what's interesting in this scene? There's so much I'm overwhelmed, and you can hold up this, and it gives you a map, all right, no matter where you are, of the kinds of things that you might be interested in that it can see. All right. Uh, let's say I'm training to be an engineer, okay? We can essentially have master engineers inspect bridges. Where do you look? What do you look for on the bridge? So you can capture their attention and train a model and then give that model to students and it will show them where to look on any bridge, anywhere. Okay. So that's really what I came to show you. I hope they didn't... Uh, does anyone have any questions? I mean, that's basically the end of the demo. I really encourage you to come and play with this technology. I really do. It's well worth your time and it's quite shocking, so uh, very powerful. Yes? How does saliency uh, compute it? Like, how, how does it know what we're looking at when it generates these? Okay, so earlier I showed you a sense that the machine knows where it is in the world. It can track my face, can track my eyes, 
and it has two cameras, actually four. Okay, so it can see out into the world, it can look at my eyes, and it can say, you're looking over there. So I will associate whatever is there with something that is of interest to you. And I accumulate that over time. And then I train a model, and I don't want to go into the math and all that heavy stuff, but I train a model based on that data to say, in this, of the features that you can detect in this scene, what do most people look at? Or what do the, my, my interest group look at? Mm -hmm. And it will light that up in real time. So, so what we're seeing glow there is uh, information that you've trained this program to know is of interest. It's yes. not looking at your eyes now, but it's accumulated that knowledge. It's accumulated the knowledge, but it's not specific to a location. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's specific to features right. in the world. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Really amazing. It has the, yes. Continue, please. No, no, carry on. Uh, what would this look like for somebody that is face blind? Who is? Face, face blind. blind. Like me. Like me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you can combine these technologies. Okay, so if we know, if we have saliency, all right, we know where to look. And if we know where to look, we can run a classifier on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we have semantic labels for something that we didn't even know was there. Um, David, if I may, just briefly on that point. Yes. It's relevant to me. I should tell. <laughs> um, how face blind are you? I recognize people by gait and uh, yeah. body shape. But you recognize that they have faces, you yeah. just oh. can't tell them apart. Yes. Salience is about they have a face. Yes. Then so I'd still be looking facial at recognition, right. 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 Um, which uh, I happen to know from a previous life that I started, David and I started down a path that he continued far down 20 years ago of facial recognition. Salience enables it to say the face is there. Facial recognition then uses the features that David had with the eyebrow shape and the geometry to identify face, then a cloud-based database of facial recognition can identify an individual if there are privacy concerns associated with that and help out people like you and me as we walk down the hall with, oh, that's David, <laughs> without just having to see six yes. foot five. Truthfully, that's the only way I know him. <laughs> question around the, um, the use of this technology. So you mentioned engineers have a certain way of inspecting bridges, and then we can give that expert gaze onto the bridge to the novice learners. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a, a body of work for radiology around this, where they track the gaze of radiologists on how they interpret images. Fantastic. And then they um, wanted to use that to train novices, and yes. that didn't work. It didn't work. And the simple reason being that um, an expert radiologist takes so many shortcuts right. um, mm -hmm. that they actually are not thorough mm -hmm. because they have that pattern recognition. They see something immediately, but when they're just looking at a normal scan, they they have right. they take shortcuts. Yes. So I guess my concern, I mean, saliency filtering is something our brain does all day, every day, all yes. the time. Um, but if our saliency filtering is too good, um, we kind of have blinders on. We yes. miss Absolutely what's right and what's left. In yes. the case of our engineer looking at the bridge, they might look at the most important point due to the saliency filter, but they'll miss the weak point because it's not the usual spot. Sure. Our radiologist, the same thing. And so um, I, I guess I, I, I think it's fascinating from a technological point of view. Um, I'm just wondering what, what the exact use case is for it in, in a way. Uh, I learned yeah. of this technology all of a week ago. <laughs> so, um, yes. So, uh, so the way I've been approaching a pedagogy from my perspective is through what I, I don't know, there's probably a proper name for it and I apologize, I'm not a, an academic in the educational space. So what we're doing is we're doing incremental learning. Mm -hmm. So essentially we're showing, the attention <coughs> might, might be from an engineer who's a year ahead of you. So second year engineers look in these places. And since you're a first engineer, you should probably focus on what the second engineers are now looking at because they've gone through the process. And then as you progress, it can actually reveal more and more. 
Another way of doing it would be to color code it. So you might have uh, white being the very experienced engineer going through a rainbow of colors with other uh, you know, various different levels of capability or experience, and you might see not just a monochromatic heat map, but actually a, you know, a polychromatic, the full color kind of spectrum of where to look and where not to look. But I really want to collaborate with you uh, to see where we can go with this. That's why I'm here. I'm, I'm looking for collaborators. This is amazing technology uh, and has huge implications for immersive experiences and for pedagogy alike. Um, I mean, just off the top of my head, we have foveated rendering. What about you know, rendering based on attention? Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the things that people pay attention to, so let's invest the energy in rendering the things that people are paying attention to or should pay attention to.